So we're going through uh, my next talk uh, here on the um, world perspective for refractive surgery um, for the BCSO 2021 course. And uh, we're doing this online, of course, because of the world pandemic that's prevented us all from traveling to the course, which is always nicer to be in person and to have the interaction. Uh, but uh, here we are. And so I'm going to talk to you about the implantable con columnar lens, which is essentially called the ICL, and patients call it the implantable contact lens. And I'm really going to talk about the optimization of the safety of this lens, because it currently has about a 1% to 3% market penetrance outside, outside of China, where it's used very commonly. But um, um, and, uh, you know, part of the reason for that is just confidence in the safety of the lens. And I'm going to talk about the latest advances in this technology, uh, which to me make it uh, an extremely attractive option for patients. So if we just go back for, to a few basics uh, before we uh, dive in, you know, in the US, the ICL was first approved um, in 2005, at the end of 2005. And there was a, there was a very long FDA process. Um, uh, there was a whole um, FDA panel discussion that was, uh, it was, there was a risk that it wasn't going to get approved and it was all to do with the sizing issues. Um, but uh, I mention it because my name came up a lot because of my research in high frequency ultrasound and how, uh, in fact, this um, this applies, and I'm going to talk about how our work over the last few years has really made a difference uh, now to this technology. But it is an extraordinary technology. Um, the material uh, was invented by a, a, a chemist uh, in Russia in the 1980s, uh, where he combined this basically a silicone with collagen from pig. And that's why it's called a colomer, a combination of collagen and, um, and a copolymer, basically of, co of, of collagen and, uh, and silicone. In terms of the dimensions, you can see that it's, you know, a little bit smaller actually than the average contact lens, because most of them are of a diameter, as you'll see, between 12.1 and 13.7 and millimeters in diameter. The optic um, is about 5.5 to 6 millimeters. Uh, it's very, very thin and very flimsy uh, and quite fiddly, in fact, to put it into the cartridge for injection. Um, it's part of the procedure, essentially one of the most challenging parts of the procedure is loading the lens. Um, but essentially the surgery is very simple. Um, um, and you know, it's about a 20th of a cataract surgery. So anybody who's finished his residency and is fairly competent at uh, fake emulsification is gonna be perfectly adequately um, skilled, manually skilled anyway, to put, uh, to put an ICL in. And that's one of the reasons why I think this is a technology that technically should be a lot more popular than it currently is because it doesn't require all of the training and refractive surgery and you know three quarters of a million dollars of equipment uh, to start doing refractive surgery. You can just literally have your own hand skills and order the lens and put it in an eye uh, after recruiting a patient very simply by explaining to them that rather than having the contact lens on your cornea, I can put a contact lens permanently in your eye. So there's a sort of market problem with that. And, and I, I think that it's because of the lack of confidence in the safety of the lens. Anyway, um, the beautiful thing about this lens is that it gives exceedingly high quality vision um, and it does so over a massive range. So actually it used to go up to minus 23, but it's now up to minus 18. And uh, astigmatism has been approved in the US recently up to minus three. So outside of the US, we have up to minus 18 sphere with up to minus six uh, astigmatism. And we have hyperopic sphere up to plus 10 with six diopters of astigmatism. So it's, an in, I mean, you can use it over an incredible range of refractive errors, particularly very, very high refractive errors. And so post-transplant, these are excellent devices. Obviously, they don't take care of the irregularities on the cornea. That's more to do with topography guided treatment, which I talked about in another lecture. Uh, but you know, it's, it gives us a, a massive power to encompass basically all refractive errors that might present 
particularly if you combine it with LASIK as well in a procedure that we call bioptics. So where does this go? Well, it goes behind the iris, but obviously in front of the lens and in front of the zonules. And these foot plates uh, of the lens will rest somewhere between the sulcus, the ciliary body, or the level of the zonules. Uh, zonules. And so that, you know, the, 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 the lens kind of sits in that region. And depending on how, how big the lens is relative to the posterior chamber, it might rise higher or even higher. Um, and, you know, if we just go back here, there is no space between the iris and the, and the, and the crystalline lens. So what we're talking about here is producing a potential space by inserting this device between um, the, the two sulci or the two ciliary bodies and having it basically tent the iris forward. So if you have a lens that is way oversized, you can actually get um, cl angle closure and uh, can be a, a real problem. So in the US uh, where the lens still doesn't have a little hole in the middle, you actually have to perform an iridectomy, uh, either surgical iridectomy during the surgery, or you can do it before uh, the procedures with the ICL with a YAG, um, but you've got to make two a small, two YAG ones and they have to be nice and big um, because angle closure and, 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 and aqueous misdirection is, is a potential blinding uh, situation in this uh, regard. So, you know, let's go on to this issue, this discussion of sizing, because the, that really is the whole thing about the ICL. And we need to understand what the impact of uh, sizing is on safety. And basically it's all the impact because an, as I explained, an oversized lens will produce angle closure, but it can also of course, then produce much more rubbing of the pigment epithelium and it can cause pigment dispersion in a normal eye, which can then cause clogging of the trochlear meshwork and glaucoma. Um, if the lens is undersized and it's too close to the crystalline lens, it can cause cataract. And you can see these, these characteristic circular cataracts that are due to the fact that the myopic lenses are thicker in the mid periphery. And so there might not be contact in the center, but there will be necess there will, you know, obviously then be contact in the mid periphery and, it, and you can get these circular anterior subcapsular cataracts, which can then progress to, to formal cataract. So you don't want the lens too big, you don't want it too small. Now, outside of the US for many years now, we've had what's called the aquaport. And this is a tiny, tiny 280 micron or 320 micron hole. I can't remember, it's very, very small anyway. And that hole allows aqueous to flow from in front and behind the ICL and according to the theory and now the practice, it has been shown to hugely diminish the incidence of cataract formation, anterior subcapsular cataract, in the event that the lens sizing is too low. Um, we don't know the full statistics on that because it's only been available for five or six years, but uh, the answer is it's greatly reduced it. I would estimate it by a factor of about 10. Uh, cataract formation in the FDA trial uh, was, um, I believe, 1.26% at, uh, at three years, uh, and obviously increasing with time. So traditionally, with, before the hole uh, was available, um, uh, Gonvers in Switzerland studied um, cataract formation and, and the vault, you know, the, 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 the separation between the ICL and the crystalline lens. And he showed that over time, uh, this vault diminishes. Obviously, part of, part mostly most of that is due to lens growth. So it's the lens growing towards the back of the ICL. And in his studies, they found that there was a much higher risk of anterior subcapsular cataract forming if the lens separation was less than ninety microns. And that might make sense with respect to the mid peripheral contact um, that we were talking about earlier. So the sizing of these lenses at that time and until you know quite recently was predicated 
only on measuring the diameter of the cornea, the white to white. And uh, the company recommended doing that with the orb scan because that's how the normal grounds have been set. Um, but you know, you could do it with a caliper and there are many devices and you know many devices will measure white to white um, and are calibrated differently. So it, it's, it is device dependent as to you know, how, you, how you size the ICL. You put this number into the STAR uh, website for ordering the lenses together with the refraction and all, and um, it recommends a lens size. Now, STAR did do some work on understanding other parameters that might influence this final lens separation. And they obviously learned that the ICL power itself makes a difference to the volt. Obviously a thicker lens will bend differently from a thinner lens. And so that'll cause different mechanics to produce a different volt. Uh, they also found statistically that the keratometry of the cornea and the AC depth had an influence on predicting the volt. And so that's essentially, you know, version 1.0 of sizing was just the white to white. Version 1.5 is what is currently on the star Ocos ordering website, where you, you would enter these parameters um, and they will recommend a lens size. Now, along the way, a number of us had been doing work on analyzing the correlation between the white to white and the, the sulcus to sulcus distance behind the iris. Because it seemed logical that if this lens was going to fit back in the sulcus, that you should be measuring the sulcus to sulcus to size the lens instead of the white to white. So if there was a poor correlation or a good correlation, that would influence how good white to white would be in predicting the ICL size. And uh, I did a, a, quite a bit of work in this respect. Uh, I attracted attention uh, with this. And it, like I mentioned at the FDA, um, 2004 FDA ophthalmic devices panel meeting, uh, there was a whole section devoted to the work that we'd done with high frequency ultrasound uh, and putting into question whether they should approve the lens um, without you know, sulcus to sulcus sizing. And the, the panel concluded that the safety was what it was and that they're going to approve it based on the safety that it was achieved, which was 1.26% cataracts by three years. Um, so let's look at some of this work that we did and, and, and try and understand, you know, the impact. So the way we plotted this was to say, well, if you're predicting the sulcus diameter from the white to white, given the correlation and, you know, this relatively low R squared, given that correlation, what are the chances that you will predict the sulcus diameter with more than half a millimeter of error. Why more than half a millimeter? Because the lenses come in half millimeter steps approximately. So 12.1, 12.6, 13.2, 13.7. So approximately 5.5 millimeter steps. So if you were gonna predict the sulcus from the white to white and you were off by 0.5 millimeters or more, the chances of that happening would be 38%, and that would mean choosing a different lens size. So if we were to then think of it as using angle to angle instead, because as the OCT machines, the anterior segment OCT machines started to come on the market, there was great excitement about the fact that maybe angle to angle or scleral spur is a scleral spur, as is used by one formula now, maybe that is more predictive of the sulcus diameter. And it turns out that the R squared is better. So 0.32 up to 0.45, so that's better. Still a very poor correlation, but you're only gonna be a little bit better in predicting the sulcus diameter. So you're still gonna have 32% of the eyes with a predicted sulcus more than half a millimeter off and therefore picking a different size lens than the ideal. What I did was to do a study where we looked at every external parameter that could be obtained without high frequency ultrasound and do a multivariate regression analysis to see what survived in the equation that would be, could be useful for predicting the sulcus if you didn't have high frequency ultrasound to directly measure the sulcus. 
And we found that the only terms that survived were the AC depth and the angle diameter, which is different from what Star had on their website, uh, because this, the, the keratometry didn't become a, was not a predictor. But using those two parameters, we only had a 26% chance of an error of half a millimeter or more, and therefore a, a lens size that was one size off the ideal. Now, when you compare this to the chances of having a half a millimeter error by measuring the sulcus directly with high frequency ultrasound with the Artemis Insight, the Artemis Insight has a repeatability of 0.12 millimeters, so 120 microns repeatability. The chances of having an error of more than 0.5 millimeters with that repeatability is less than 1%. So as you can see, we're at least 25 times more likely to not have a one size off error if we measure directly the sulcus rather than estimate the sulcus from the white to white. Now, is there a 25 to 35% complication rate with sizing with the ICL? The answer is no. And that's because it's very forgiving. If the lens is too large, you can probably leave it in the eye. If it's too low, you can probably leave it in the eye. And the exchange rates that are reported, um, well, the company reports it as being 1%. Um, I have extremely um, uh, surgically adept colleagues here in, in London, and we are very friendly with each other and we discuss this and one of them has a 2% exchange rate the other one has a 5% exchange rate and they're both you know level 7 you know five star general phaco emulsification surgeons with superb cataract skills um, so it's not like they're there's anything uh, about their technique i i believe that the 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 exchange rate depends a lot on your sensitivity uh, to leaving a lens in that's not an ideal size. Um, and when I think that, I think what we're talking about when, 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 when the company talks about exchange rate, I think what they're talking about, we have to realize is they're talking about eyes in which the surgeon was not willing to leave the lens in. And that threshold is what probably causes the difference in exchange rates between surgeons. Um, it's not just us. Uh, high frequency ultrasound in the 1990s was the first way of, of, of doing this. Uh, Mark Rondeau study actually, which we haven't put on this slide uh, from Cornell, um, but um, others have had been finding with uh, lower frequency, high frequency ultrasound devices um, that you know there was very poor correlation between the white to white and the sulcus diameter. Um, Doherty um, was part of the FDA trial and he actually took his data from ultrasound and devised a formula. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But he also showed that, the, the, you know, there was just, uh, you would choose a different size, um, you know, a, a large number of times uh, if you used ultrasound versus white to white sizing. So Doherty published a, a nomogram table that depends on the, uh, on the sulcus to sulcus measurement, but also noted that the ICL power makes a difference. Uh, to the predictability of the volt size. And he basically um, became a standard um, around the world for sizing. Um, in our study with Carlo Lovisolo, uh, who is a dear colleague who wrote a 400 page, 350 page textbook on the ICL by 1990. Uh, so well before it was even available in the US, this guy was already an academic expert uh, at this technology. Um, he developed a formula from sulcus to sulcus using the Artemis Insight 100 technology. He had a prototype in Milan um, and in a study that we did together, we found that in, in more than half the eyes, uh, we selected a lens based on sulcus that would be different from that which we would have chosen based on white to white uh, from the STAR website. Um, and this had consequences because when we looked in that study at um, the dispersion of the volt, we found that in his study, um, the, the, the mean volt was approximately what he intended at 350 microns with a, you know, a range, but only one eye ended up with less than 90 microns of volt. Whereas had we used the STAR formulas um, 
off their website had we we back calculated what the volt would have been using you know easy trigonometry um we would have had uh, 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 13 eyes um uh, 26 percent of the eyes would have had a volt of less than 90 um and obviously the the interquartile distance uh, uh, would have been double that had we used white to white for sizing so this was a fairly um uh you know, a big wake up call study for us. Um, and when we compared the results achieved by sulca sizing than by white to white sizing. So along came uh, uh, our friend, Dr. Kojima in Japan. And he said, well, there's one other parameter that determines uh, the distance between the ICL and the crystalline lens. And that's the sulcus to sulcus lens rise. So obviously how much this lens pokes out over that plane, which is very logical because that makes it get closer to the ICL, right? Uh, and so in my clinic, we were using, essentially using the Kojima formula, using, Kojima developed the formula using high frequency ultrasound systems. That's 20 to 30 megahertz handheld scanners. We have the Insight 100, uh, which you know has 60 megahertz scanning, much higher resolution. Uh, and we were using the Kojima formula, which has the anterior segment, uh, the uh, AC depth, sulcus, sulcus, and the um, sulcus, sulcus lens rise as, as factors for predicting that. And obviously, we were expecting to get better results because we had higher resolution ultrasound uh, at play here. So we did uh, 42 eyes with the brand new delivered Insight 100 uh, scanner. Um, and we used multivariate regression to determine a model that we hoped would predict um, uh, even better uh, the size of the ICL. So uh, how did we do this? Well, we took all of the parameters that are easily determined from you know just any exam without high frequency ultrasound, the white to white, obviously you know the power, the ICL size and the scotopic pupil, because obviously a smaller pupil will push the lens back, a larger pupil will have the lens go forward more. On ultrasound, we measured the AC depth the angle of the anterior chamber, the angle to angle distance, the sulcus to sulcus distance, the sulcus to sulcus lens rise as per Kojima, but also the zonular to zonular distance, the zonular to zonular lens rise, and the ciliary body inner diameter, as I called it. It was a last minute ad ad addition which I thought, well, let's measure it. But of course, these are the ciliary processes and these can kind of, you might catch them or not catch them on a scan. So I thought it was a bit of a soft target, uh, but we stuck it in because you got to stick everything in, right? What we found was that the ciliary body inner diameter was such a significant predictor of the lens separation that it threw out the sulcus to sulcus. In a way, the the, the 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 academic gold standard for sizing, which was sulcus to sulcus, they said that the general public was using white to white, but the academic one was sulcus to sulcus, and it required a lot of expertise for these handheld devices, and it was quirky, and some surgeons didn't get better sizing, so it had a very mixed um, mixed uh, review, let's say, using ultrasound. Nevertheless, our formula found that the ciliary body inner diameter was so predictive that we couldn't get the sulcus back into the equation. Uh, we did uh, get the sulcus to sulcus lens rise to survive in the equation um, and the scotopic pupil size. So these things became important. And now we're using three parameters that were never described before uh, with, for, for, the, for predicting uh, lens separation. The other thing that uh, that occurred to me was that you know the star website recommends a lens that you should buy the Doherty table you look it up it recommends a lens size the Kojima gives you the ideal lens size and I guess you pick one that's closest uh, that's available there are only four sizes available and I thought to myself well you know it's not just one size fits all because if you have a deep chamber you might want the lens to be a bit higher if particularly if the patient's younger and they have more room for lens growth so I thought let's actually provide the predicted volt for each available lens for that eye. And so our formula spits out what we predict the volt will be for each of the commercially available lens sizes. 
And this way you can, uh, you know, a little bit customize if you like how the lens fits. So what were our results? Well, in our regression analysis, we found a mean of 500 microns uh, with a range of 700. And as you can see, if we had used the star formula, it would have been a higher mean. The Doherty and Kojima would have been pretty similar. Well, obviously, because we were using sulcus to sulcus sizing. And because we were using the Kojima, we expected it to be better, but it's actually, it was the same. So it turned out that using better resolution ultrasound didn't improve on the sizing compared to just the lower resolution Kojima, obviously as an expert with a handheld device. But when we compared what lens size we would have chosen with the model versus the one that we chose with our formula or with the star formula or the Doherty or the Kojima, what, was, what came out was quite shocking. And that is that in about a quarter of the cases, we chose a lens that was two sizes smaller than the star website would have suggested to us. And that would have been using our new model. So the question now is, what about applying the model to the data that we just derived it from, just as a guide to see what effect it might have on sizing? It's not a mathematically pure thing to do. But when we did that, we saw that, you know, obviously the scatter would go down significantly. Um, the mean would obviously stay the same but the interquartile range would, would go down uh, significantly. Well, this is, the, this is the total range. So the, the other thing we looked at was there's a distribution of the lenses that we chose using the Kojima formula. And what we found was that the distribution wasn't uh, symmetrical. In fact, the mean, if you like, would be somewhere there. And that means that the mean eye doesn't have a lens for it. And so what, what if there was a lens in between the 12.6 and the 13.2? What if there was a 12.9? Using our model, how often would we have chosen the 12.9? The answer is a third of the time. Well, that makes sense, right? About a third of the population is within one standard deviation of the mean. That all fits. Now you have an even distribution of lens choices, as you would expect with for an even distribution of, of posterior chamber sizes. And so this is an interesting point is that, you know, by virtue of how STAR historically developed the ICL, they didn't end up with a lens that was actually of the mean size of the mean eye. So the important thing now is to look at things prospectively. And when we looked at it prospectively using this new formula, we were amazed to see that we were able to predict Volt within 300 microns in over 90% of the eyes. And over half the eyes were within 100 microns of intended. Now that was interesting, even more so because there were four big outliers in, in this series that we did. And we went back to those two patients with four eyes and learned something different about the mechanics of how the lens works and actually recalculated parameters that would have rendered those four eyes had we done them with one size under to go obviously within the 300 micron range. And so all of this remember is without a 12.9 millimeter lens, which would be the ideal lens in the average case one third of the eyes. So what does that do? And how does that fit? Well, it turns out that prospectively using this new formula, we have an interquartile range that has gone down significantly and the outliers have gone down significantly. And it's the outliers that cause the exchanges to occur. So whereas the exchange rate is between one and 5%, depending on your threshold of uh, tolerance as a, as, as a clinician, we believe now that our exchange rate is well less than 1% based on this predictability data. We've placed this equation into a website, which is free to go to. It's based on the ASCRS calculator concept where you have all of the formulas. And so you can go here, enter your data, and you know, derive uh, as you please 
um, which lens to use based on what data you're providing it. So for example, if you only provided the sulcus to sulcus data and, 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 and the power, then it would give you the Kojima, uh, sorry, the Doherty uh, sizing prediction. If you entered the AC depth, uh, as well as the sulcus to sulcus lens rising, you're using the, it would, it would give you the Kojima and the Doherty. Uh, whereas if you enter all the parameters, then you will get our predicted formula, which is the London Vision Clinic formula here. Um, we also included the Nakamura formula, um, which is based on um, uh, anterior angle measurements, um, which come directly from OCT. Um, and you can see that, um, you know, pro providing all of the different um, options can be quite useful. Um, so I'm just going to show you what it's like for me on post up day one, and that was the post up day one is the is 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 the is the kind of anxiety drive to the clinic because you're not sure you know where are these lenses going to you're going to have to exchange one are things not going to be good, and quite frankly it's a pleasure now. Uh, these are just screen captures from our EMR. Um, you know, we predicted 507 and we ended up with 510. We predicted uh, 555, uh, we have 663. We predicted 518, we have 408. We predicted 407, we have 467. And it's just a pleasure. And I want to finish by just, you know, emphasizing, you know, uh, sorry about this, uh, but, you know, what can be done outside of FDA jurisdiction. Um, and I know a lot of you who take this uh, BCSO course at Columbia are from outside of the U.S., so you're not going to feel too bad. But here's an example. Here's a 29-year-old male. He's a management consultant, very high-level intellectual, struggling with his glasses, obviously, you can see, and his contact lenses, long hours. And his manifest refraction is very, very high hyperopia with astigmatism. And, you know, it just so happens that he has an anterior chamber depth, which is sufficient to put an ICL in. And here he is post-op, you know, amazing uh, with, a, with a lens separation that's going to allow him to basically leave this lens in is for the rest of his life, a nice open angle. Um, and, uh, you know, this guy is basically permanently cured. If he develops any changes in a refractive error, we can do corneal surgery on top of that to, 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 to fix that. Here's another um, prize case, gold medal case. This is a very high mix cylinder. Um, uh, he's an Eastern European man uh, who presented with very high mixed astigmatism, uh, plus five minus 11 in his left eye, incredibly uh, correctable to 2020 despite this um, unbelievable level of astigmatism. Um, and we decided to treat him by debulking the mixed cylinder with a um, hyperopic astigmatic uh, or bitoric um, cylindrical ICL. And we, you know, our target refractions here, which will be easily correctable by bitoric LASIK procedures. Um, and as you can see here, this was his pre-op uh, right eye and pre-op left eye measurements with high frequency ultrasound, the lens uh, predictions, um, our formula, um, um, we, we use the 13.7, which is gonna leave him with just, a, we, we, we thought with just over 500 microns of lens separation. You can see that the star formula uh, would have predicted 13.2, which would have left him with a lot less. And uh, the, the sulcus to sulcus base measurement from Doherty would have been a 12.6, and that would have been really low probably too low actually. So here we are, patient is at um, I think three months post-op now, so quite settled. And you can see that the um, predicted volts are superbly close to uh, what we uh, would like. And certainly anatomically, these ICLs are now in, in, in it could not be in a better position for long-term safety um, and, and longevity uh, of the safety of leaving this lens in the eye. And of course he is almost bang on target. Um, that's the other thing about the ICL is that it is superbly accurate um, compared to laser eye surgery, 10 times more accurate, especially as you go up in, in prescriptions. So we get about, um, for myopia from minus eight to minus 14 with smile outside of the US, um, we have about 65% of the eyes uh, 2020 uh, with the ICL, it's over 90%. And that's, you know, just 
a matter of fact, the cornea is not a piece of plastic and the ICL is a piece of plastic. So it is exceedingly accurate, um, especially as we use, um, you know, um, uh, non-manual automated iris recognition uh, toric um, uh, alignment. We use the Callisto from Zeiss in our uh, OPNI, in our, our TIVO. So that is a run through on the ICL and particularly with some emphasis on, you know, the newest developments in, in the sizing of the ICL, which have technically, in my view, make this almost a, a bulletproof um, a technology. Um, but also just an example of the fact that, you know, there are approvals that eventually, hopefully will come down the road to the US um, if the FDA starts to accept extrapolation and international data, which apparently they are starting to do. They're starting to include real, um, it's called uh, um, real life data, or I think I forgot the term, but they're now starting to include post-market data from the community as evidence, as opposed to having to do everything by a prospective, extraordinarily expensive uh, prospective trial. So again, off my soapbox, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this, and um, you all have my email um, from the uh, handouts if there's anything you'd like to uh, ask or to come and visit uh, in London once uh, travel becomes possible. Thank you very much, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your course.